there's been a tectonic shift in two really exciting things over the past year. Uh, the first is JavaScript tooling. We've had a huge surge of progress there on the front end. And the second is web components. Now, um, at the start of the web, we had tags, and that's how you'd build your pages. Um, you used tags for everything. We had form, we had select, and they had a lot of meaning. They also came with encapsulation. Um, they would broadcast events whenever anything interesting happened. But we sort of moved away from, from that model of using things that are decorative on the web. We now either copy really large chunks of boilerplate from um, frameworks like Bootstrap into our apps, um, or we end up putting a lot of our logic into JavaScript where perhaps it, it belongs a little bit more in our, in our markup. Now ideally, HTML would be expressive enough to allow us to create complex widgets and complex apps and uh, sort of allow us to fill in the gaps of, of where we're missing these tags at the moment. And this is one of the places where web components can actually help us today. So to give you some examples, we can bring back the blink tag. So we can bring back, yes, the blink tag, it's awesome. Uh, so we can bring back the blink tag. And if you actually inspect this um, in Chrome and go, go into the dev tools, hopefully this is big enough for everybody to see, but you'll see that there's actually a tag here um, that contains this content. There's no, no other source that's currently visible um, until we actually turn on the ability to view its, its shadow DOM, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. But this is our own custom tag containing custom functionality. We can actually go uh, further with this as well. Um, we can create our own Miley Cyrus tag, if we want to as well, the X Miley tag. Now similar to the blink tag, if we go and we inspect this tag, what you'll notice is that, you know, it's, it's a valid tag in the DOM. There's actual content there. But it, this, this tag's got a little bit of a secret to it. If we go and we hover over it. I came in like a I never hit so See, this is what the web was made for. Some of the other things that are slightly more uh, practical that you can do with web components are define custom behaviors and, and custom components. So here we've got a, a UI widget for cards. Um, if you use Google Plus or, or any of the more recent Google apps, um, cards are probably something you're, you're used to. But here we've got touch events, which are allowing us to just swipe this back and forth. And it looks great on mobile, it looks great on desktop. So there's this, which is like a card tag as well. Um, another thing you can do is you can put together complete applications with an entire tag. So here we have a meme tag um, with Brendan Eich. And one of the nice things about this is that not only can we have like functionality encapsulated within a single tag, but we can have other components actually extend that functionality and have different elements speak to one another. So here I have one element here that contains the, the, the meme. And I have another um, element at the very top which allows me to actually go and change the background image very easily. So, you know, just without too much effort, I can, you know, I can do something like this. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a thing, it's, it's cool, it's nice. <laughs> Some of the other more practical things that, that might be of interest to you are the ability to easily create things like charting components. So here, um, take a look at the, uh, the tag being used here. All I'm passing to this is just the values that I'd like displayed. There's no additional JavaScript that I'm having to supply to this tag in order to get all of this working. It's just, it's working pretty well. It's, it's pretty nice. But uh, let's, let's move on a little bit. So our agenda for today is I'm first of all going to take you through a little bit more of uh, JavaScript tooling and, and what the current status is of that stuff. We're then going to take a look at web components. And finally, we're going to build a sexy web app using these technologies. So trying to develop for the web today can sometimes feel like doing your taxes in the middle of an amazing party. It's, it's a little bit difficult because we have so many different technologies and tools that we can use that we, we want to be able to get into our workflow. And yet getting all of these tools working nicely together can sometimes be a little bit of a challenge. My own personal commit log for most apps looks a little bit like this. Let's commit the initial web app, add some more boilerplate, more scripts, a little bit of pain. Okay, these are getting meaningful. And it just gets better over time. Now our tooling landscape is getting a little bit more complex. We're having to deal with boilerplates, testing solutions, frameworks, dependency management, um, continuous integration, version control. And once again, getting these things working nicely together can be a little bit difficult. And it's daunting, especially to beginners, when they just want to be able to write code, and yet this is what they have to deal with. 
Now, time is a really key factor in staying productive. And so you want to be able to automate as much as you can in your workflow to, to stay effective. So automate repetitive tasks to stay effective. This is actually a real thing. And automation, it's not about being lazy. It's about trying to be efficient with your time and the way that you do things. Now, the average front-end workflow today looks a little bit like this. We scaffold, so we go get boilerplates. We download libraries. We download templates. We download frameworks. And we do that all the time. It's a very repetitive loop. Then during development, we have to watch our CSS preprocessors and our different abstractions, like our SAS or Elastic Stylus. Maybe you're using you know, a language abstraction like CoffeeScript or Jade. We then have live reload, so getting a nice visual um, uh, look at what our application state actually looks like while we're authoring. Linting. And then you've got your build process, which includes things like code linting, running unit tests, compilation, generating images, optimizing, and so on. But these are lots of repetitive tasks that we tend to do on most of the projects that we work on. And surely, there has to be a much better way of doing this stuff. And one solution to this set of problems is a workflow named Yeoman. So we started working on this project a year ago, uh, along with some other teams working on Grunt and Bower. And we think that it's going to be something that you'll personally find useful in your day-to-day -day workflow if you, if you try it out. But let's talk about the three pieces that make up Yeoman. Now, the first is Grunt. Now, Grunt is a fantastic task runner for the front end. It's great for setting up a, a, you know, a, a really awesome um, build process. There is a huge ecosystem of tasks around it for doing pretty much whatever you want. And uh, Grunt has been getting so popular um, over the last couple of months that uh, the last stats say that uh, somewhere in the region of 330,000 people installed Grunt last month, which is crazy. I imagine most of the people in this room are already using it. So Grunt is awesome. Another thing that's part of the Yeoman workflow is Bower. Um, and Bower is great for package management. So rather than you having to manually deal with your dependencies and download them yourself, it can help you, you take care of, of a lot of that through tooling. Now, package management is still something that's a little bit new to the front end. And so you know, people aren't necessarily as familiar with it. But it's still something that can be useful. And I'll show it to you in just a bit. And then you have Yo, which comes as part of Yeoman. But it's a scaffolding tool, which lets you sort of write out your, your application. It gives you boilerplates. It gives you grunt tasks that will be useful for the type of application you're working on. And it'll prescribe best practices for some of the things that you might like to do, like um, proper unit testing or, or creating applications that will be fantastic on mobile and desktop. But Yeoman isn't necessarily without you know, its flaws. People will ask, you know, uh, how flexible are these tools? Are they production ready? And are they future proof? Now, um, on the flexibility side of things, it's, it's very easy to customize Yeoman or Yeoman generator, so the way that you scaffold, um, to your own needs. And, and many people have already done that. Um, Production-wise, there are companies using Grunt and using Bower and using Yeoman to, to create um, sort of production level apps. And on the future proofing side, um, I'm actually going to talk about how you can use Yeoman to scaffold out applications using web components in just a moment. So some of you might have heard of, a, uh, of Polymer. So, or you, know, you, you might have come to the website for it. It looks a little bit like this. And, and maybe you, you read our tagline. But it says, Polymer is a new type of library for the web built on top of web components. And it's designed to leverage sort of the future web platform um, in modern browsers. So all those awesome new features that are there. And when you start investigating Polymer, you might ask, you know, what, what is this? So, so, you know, is this a set of polyfills? Well, yeah, sort of. Is it a framework? It's sort of that, too. Um, is it UI widgets? Well, we're working on that as well. So it's, it's a few different things. But in order for us to understand where we're going, we have to understand where we've been. So let's go back in time very quickly. So transport yourself back in time to an earlier day. So this is Google.com today. Let's transport ourselves back to 1998. Now, this is probably what your first web page looked like. Um, you know, you had access to a couple of elements to play with. You had sort of selects. You had uh, form elements and, and a number of other things. Because we're developers, our, our pages probably looked a little bit more like this. <laughs> Thanks to absolute positioning, it actually looks like the, uh, the guy constructing the site is trying to put out the fire, and the baby's just dancing around it. It's not, it's not very good. So, I was talking about select a moment ago. Select is actually a pretty awesome element. Um, with select, you can just put some options into there, and it just knows what to do with those options. It's actually really, really powerful. So you've seen this a million times before. This is not, this is not new to you. But with these children elements, like as soon as you place them in, it gives them some default UI. You don't even have to touch CSS. You don't have to touch JavaScript to get that. It's just baked into the platform for you. It's this nice native component. 
This is sort of your classic example of running out of swag at a conference. So, you know, every single size other than extra large is, is just gone, um, and nothing's available but that. But because we have this sort of disabled attribute on our children options, um, all of those are disabled except for the extra large options. So we're configuring these elements, not using scripts, but just by using HTML, and it's, it's kind of nice. So we're plopping in attributes on these options, and we're able to get some nice different behavior on these tags. Um, here, we're able to drop in an opt group and actually change completely how this element looks, feels, and reacts. So I've just added in an opt group for French cars. And here you'll see that the actual UI has changed. Again, no JavaScript necessary for this. The, the platform's just giving me this power. And it's actually quite nice. In addition to that, um, the select element and many of the other elements that we had back then actually had a, a rather nice rich DOM interface to them. They would you know, let the page know and let other people know if something interested happened, if you set up an event listener to those things. Um, and so I think that you know, it's possible for us to go back to a time where, where this stuff is, is how we develop for the web, for like how we create our own components. So let's very quickly take a look at, at where we are now. So tabs are a pretty you know, common component on the web. We use them all the time. But the way that we build tabs today is a little bit interesting. So one solution might be, you know, a few years ago, maybe we stuck a lot of data in, in, into our markup and, and we just used jQuery or something to uh, turn that markup into you know, some tabs. But over time, we've started moving more and more of the logic behind how we create um, these tabs into our JavaScript. And very, very little of it is in our markup. And I would say that there's something a little weird about that. Perhaps that's not necessarily the right way to go about solving this problem. Because when I see this, I see something that isn't as readable, isn't as simple as it could be. And this is XJS, which is, again, trying to move a lot of the logic into JavaScript. So we're piling on a lot of JavaScript in places we don't necessarily need to. Um, if you look at Gmail in the DevTools, you'll actually see something that looks like this. It's, it's actually pretty atrocious. Um, I'm not entirely sure what's going on here. But you know, if I, if I um, if I was developing using web components, you know, maybe things would be better. So tabs using web components could look a little bit like this. And it's, it's very simple. I, I want to define a group of tabs, so I just say my tabs. I want to create like, a subgroup of actual tab headings, I just say my tab. And I can say using attributes whether they're selected or not. If I want to dynamically create tabs, I can just use JavaScript to do that and append them to, my, to the DOM. It's not, not that difficult. Now Polymer is actually based on standards from the ground up. It's, uh, it's, it, it also comes with um, a nice layer of sugaring on top of it, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But it's, it's based on four um, W3C specs. Uh, templates, uh, which are basically inert pieces of DOM that, you, that give you sort of a, a nice uh, platform-based way to do JavaScript templating, the same way that you're used to doing today. We have HTML imports, which give us, uh, finally, a way of importing and packaging together CSS, JavaScript, and HTML so that they can be easily imported into other documents. We have custom elements, which give us the ability to um, define our own vocabulary for the web and for the way that we create our own applications. And then we have Shadow DOM, which gives us the ability to get true encapsulation um, in our pages. Uh, so not having to you know, rely on things like iframes anymore, or having to worry about styles or scripts or application logic leaking into the rest of the page. Now, Polymer itself um, has polyfills for all of these features that work in all modern browsers, but it also has this sugaring layer containing a little bit of a framework that makes it uh, more pleasant to work with these features. So this was the Angular app. And uh, basically, the idea here was you know, you're, you're at a party. You want to be able to play music. Other people want to be able to add stuff. Maybe they don't necessarily have you know, a Spotify account. And so you know, Maybe people will you know, uh, go in, try to look for some music. They'll click on the title that they want. And it just gets added to this playlist. And whatever, what happens whenever you um, sort of start playing through the videos in this list is as soon as one video is completed, um, it'll go and start playing the next one. And you also get access to this nice sort of history um, at the side as well, which is pretty neat. Now, um, I set about trying to recreate this. Uh, using web components. And if you take a look at these two, they're, they're pretty much identical, except one of them is using um, a really nice, simple vocabulary for describing all of the different components that live on this page. We can actually go in and take a look at some of the, the, the code behind this. So um, if we take a look here, you'll notice that we have, I'm going to just bump up the font size very quickly so people can see this. What you'll notice is that we have a Polymer element here um, that describes this component. 
where we've got some templating here, which allows us to basically uh, describe the entire component and decide what gets shown to, to the rest of the world and what gets hidden. Um, we then have some, some logic here for other components. Now, uh, here we have sort of a, an input that allows me to go and describe um, what uh, search query I'm looking for. And if you take a look, we've got this, uh, we've got this little event here that says, uh, on any input to this tag, go and commit an action. And these look, this looks a little bit like handlebars, but if you go down to commit action, it's, it's actually quite nice to work with. There's not that much code to this either. So here, what I'm doing is using this nice little utility. It's, it's a dollar, so you're, used to, you're probably used to using jQuery and, and the dollar sign. So this just lets me access the DOM and query things within the scope of this component, just using the dollar sign. And I can go and I can easily change things. Um, I can actually also go and bind different data. So if we look at the, uh, the description for this component, you'll see that we have some, some JavaScript here. We do have some, some data being stored there. So here I have like a, a YouTube object. I've got an object that seeds the initial playlist that's being shown to people, so the initial history as well. And what happens when I go and add any items to these lists is thanks to uh, template binding, um, I'm actually able to automatically refresh the UI so that there's sort of this nice constant link between what's being shown to the user and what's going on in my code. Now let's say that um, I want to go and start working on a new app uh, using uh, something like Polymer. Well, you can actually use Yeoman to do this for you. Uh, I'm going to try bumping up the font size here all the way up. So the way that you um, generally install Yeoman is using npm install geo. And you can install a generator for writing Polymer apps um, just by typing in generator Polymer. Now, I already have this installed. But what happens when I go and I type in yo Polymer is that it asks me some questions about the application that I want to create. So it'll ask me, would you like to include Twitter Bootstrap for SaaS? In this case, I don't want to, so I just press no. Um, and what this does is it would actually go and scaffold me out all of the boilerplate needed for a new Polymer app. It would include uh, grunt tasks that would help me with things like concatenating all of my web components together using a tool the Polymer team wrote called Vulcanize. Um, and it also helps you do things like optimize all of your scripts, all of your assets, all of the images, and other things that you have inside your page. Now, what's really neat about this, let's, uh, let's go back to uh, a directory that I created a little bit earlier. So let's say there. So in here, we have um, an application that's already had yo Polymer run against it. Now, what I can do if I want to create a new Polymer element is just run yo Polymer element, type in the name of the element that I want to create, and then it'll ask me some other questions about it. So would you like to include a constructor? Would you like to import this to our index using imports? Would you like to import any other local elements into this page? Um, would you like to in, uh, import any elements installed by a Bower into this page as well? Now, one of the really neat things um, about uh, this workflow is that if I wanted to go and install Polymer, it's as simple as Bower install Polymer platform. And what this does is it installs just the polyfills layer from Polymer. If you want to install um, the rest of Polymer and you happen to be using a component that requires it, they'll automatically resolve their dependencies. So actually going and installing um, something like uh, a YouTube search component is as simple as just typing in that. And it'll go and install it for you. And it'll include all the code that you need to get started. If I wanted to do something like um, Ajax in my application, um, because we now have access to creating our own custom tags, we can actually use um, this exact same process. So I can go and I can install this. Um, it'll go off to NPM. As long as the Wi-Fi is working, everything should hopefully go OK. But basically what this does for us is it goes and it installs some components that we can start using in our application. So this is Polymer Ajax. Um, and the way that I go and I use Ajax in my applications using this is quite simple. So this is the element. It's called Polymer Ajax. Using attributes, I'm able to go and configure the component. I just pass it a URL for what I'd like it to load up, pass it some parameters using attributes as well, pass in how I want this to be handled. And then when I get a response back from this, I can actually repeat the response directly inside a template. And just within sort of two or three lines of code, I actually have a functional application in place doing something useful. If I wanted, I could even go further. And I could say, OK, well, let's create a new input field type equals text, maybe. Um, and we can say the value of this is going to bind to something like a new query. 
What I can then do is actually bind that query back to my Polymer Ajax component so that any time that I go and I make an instant search within that field, my page will refresh automatically without me having to do anything. It's a lot less boilerplate to get really, really functional apps up and running. One of the great things is because we have so many components available to go and create like rich, complex apps, um, it takes you very little effort to get up and running with something that's going to be useful to you. So um, I'm almost out of time, so I'm just going to give you a very quick summary of what Polymer gives you. It gives you declarative um, element registration without having to worry about too much boilerplate, easy inheritance, two-way data binding, declarative event handlers, published properties. Um, it gives you these nice property change watchers. So if any property inside your application changes, you can easily go um, and react to it. It gives you automatic node finding using a nice jQuery-like API. And it gives you things like pointer events and other future platform features right out of the box. So to learn more about Polymer, go check it out at polymerproject.org. Um, we're really excited to hear what you think, you know, whether you're building anything with it, whether you've got any feedback. Um, for more information about Yeoman, check us out at yeoman.io. We now have generators for sort of full stack development, Angular, pretty much anything you can imagine. Hopefully, you know, you'll go and try this stuff out and it will be useful to you. Um, one thing that's for sure is that all of your friends are going to be like this when you understand how it works. So I'm out of time. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you.